So we also have, in addition to uh, Elder Edwards uh, here, who is our uh, Religious Liberty and Trust uh, stewardship uh, for stewardship, sorry, for South Atlantic. We also have Rick Hutchinson is here today from Carolina Conference. Rick, if you'll stand. Rick is. <laughs> Rick is trust services and stewardship. Is stewardship? Well, actually, in Carolina Conference, we call it generous living. Generous <laughs> living. We follow God's command, John three sixteen, because what's the verb? God. He gave. He gave. And He wants us to follow His example in everything we do. And so we call stewardship generous living Amen. because without him and without his blessings, where would we be? Amen. And he gives us blessings to share with everybody. Amen. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, Rick. Welcome. So how many people how many people have heard my current event seminar this year? I know that there are some people from is anybody here from Murfreesboro? Oh, have you heard it? Not this year. Have you heard it this year? Oh, yeah, Shiloh, that's right. Anybody else? Shiloh? Just one. Okay, good. So every, every, every Sabbath, my current events uh, seminar changes. Just like we did earlier, well, earlier being last night, um, today, if you have a question, write it down, and I'll try to cover it at the end of the seminar, okay? So here we go. Let's take a look at what's going on in our world around us today. Now remember that last night I told you that we can't put our trust in any political party. And last night's seminar was about a lot of what was left over from the Obama administration. Today's seminar is going to cover mostly a lot of the new stuff that we're facing with the new administration, which is Trump's administration. And so the first thing I want to talk about is this idea of vouchers. Now this goes kind of to the stewardship side of what we're talking about. This is money that, that will go to parochial schools. A parochial school is a religious school. And for years, the voucher programs and the voucher schemes have been around. In the old-timey days, old-timey being in the 1990s, <laughs> in the old timey days, we used to call it parochiaid, aid to parochial schools. Now we call it vouchers. Uh, the Supreme Court in Florida, in our territory, in the Southern Union, was the first court to strike down vouchers in 1999, and they said that vouchers violated the Blaine Amendments of their state. A Blaine Amendment is an amendment that says states will not take money from the Treasury and give it to religious organizations. In other words, your tax dollars, which is where the, tr the state Treasury gets its money, your tax dollars will not be used to fund religious activities. And so, Florida had originally struck those down. Now, Florida, if anybody here is from Florida, you'll know that Florida has um, a different kind of scholarship program now that they use. Uh, it's not tax-based dollars, but it's dollars from businesses who get a, corporations who get a tax deduction for giving to this fund for, for uh, private schools. Vouchers have been a problem based on our understanding that our tax dollars will not go to support religious schools, especially if you don't espouse that particular uh, religion that the school is, is connected to. In North Carolina, how many people here are taxpayers in the great state of North Carolina? Please raise your hand. All right. Everybody else is from South Carolina? Or you're just too tired to raise your hand. <laughs> Father Abraham, did you end? Have some Georgia people here. Georgia, okay. We got a lot of Georgiaites. Georgia, Georgia peaches. Um, Georgia pecans. 
We're all nuts, right? It's from driving in Atlanta traffic. Um, so, <laughs> we, in North Carolina, you have something called Opportunity Scholarships in North Carolina, and these are scholarships that go to mostly very poor uh, children who want to have a better uh, than than public school education. Everybody here believes in church school? Yes. Adventist education, yay. Go to church school. Um, I was in Concord in your in your conference, and I, I said I said a bad word in church. I said that, that public school was crappy. <laughs> a church member objected to me using that word. <laughs> I said, well, it's the best word I can use for public schools. <laughs> but in North Carolina, the opportunity scholarships go to underprivileged children. 90%, let's take a guess, who gets 90% of the tax dollars to private parochial schools in North Carolina. You want to take a guess? Catholics. How many people say Catholics? Everybody? Anybody want to guess someone, something else? 1%. There might be a 1% out there. Seventh-day Adventist? That's a, that's a good guess. No. 90% of the tax dollars that go to the Opportunity Scholarship go to Muslim schools in North Carolina. Ah, right. Interesting, isn't it? So uh, three weeks ago, uh, Trump released his, this is, this is his terminology, not mine, his America First, a budget blueprint to make America great again. And in it, he specifically is talking about voucher, vouchers and budgeting plans for vouchers. In the plan, he has promised to fund more private school choice through tax dollars. In the plan, within the next year, his goal is to increase money for charter schools to $168 million. And then to private school choice programs, by the end of the next two years, he wants to increase it to $250 million dollars to private schools. So there was a lot of, that's a lot of money, and the question is where are you going to get that much money <laughs> in, the, in the budget? <laughs> now one thing that his budget blueprint to make America great again failed to do was it failed to stipulate how it was going to fund all these millions and millions of dollars. One speculation that uh, analysis that our analyzers who are smarter than I am have predicted is that it's very possible they could use a tax credit plan for people who choose non-public schools. In other words, you've chosen a non-public school to send your child to, you would get a tax credit for uh, when you filed your taxes because you had your child in a school other than the public school system. That's just one such um, guess. In our territory, we've had uh, different uh, approaches to, to school vouchers. Um, one of the top ten stories, I think, from last year was the voucher programs that were okay and not okay. So in Oklahoma, there were two voucher schemes that went to, I'm going to pull this off. There were two voucher schemes that went to court last year. There was an Oklahoma voucher scheme and a Nevada ESA. Anybody here know what an ESA is? Educational Savings Account. All right. The courts in Oklahoma upheld the voucher schemes in Oklahoma saying that they didn't believe that the state was supporting religion. So that because the vouchers weren't going to public schools, the vouchers were going to parents who then decided where they would put their children in private school. And this is one of the little loopholes that you're going to find in vouchers. The government will say, well, this isn't direct dollars going straight to, this is dollars going to parents. And then the parents can choose. Um, and in Oklahoma, that particular voucher scheme was upheld. Interestingly enough, 
even, even though we had two voucher cases last year, they didn't turn out the same. Because in Nevada, the Nevada courts argued that the route of the funding wasn't the appropriate way and that it wasn't properly funded. So in Nevada, and I think Nevada has, the courts in Nevada has, have pretty much given the unspoken yet wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you can fix this voucher program if you do it a different way. And so what's happening here is they said it wasn't properly funded, but they didn't say it was unconstitutional. So what they're saying is go back to the drawing boards and see if you can't do a little bit better. Here in, here in Georgia, I'm not in Georgia, I'm in South Carolina. In, in Georgia this term, we've seen two proposed budget uh, bills come up in this session. And in our office, we try to monitor all of our states for legislative agenda items that are going to affect religious liberty. One was a, a Senate Resolution 105. It was a constitutional amendment so as to prevent discrimination in the public funding of social services by re allowing religious or faith-based organizations to receive public aid directly or indirectly for the provisions of such service. So what do we do when we want a bill to pass? We say that it's an amendment to prevent discrimination because that gets you from the go. Oh yeah, we want to prevent discrimination. Well, what is the bill really? It's an amendment to allow tax dollars to go to religious entities, whether they be churches or church schools or Catholic charities or whatever it may be. There was a second bill that came up, Senate Bill number 68, relating to elementary and secondary education, so as to establish a, a, EA, a SEA, a student educational account. So those are the two that we've seen. In religious liberty, because we are strict separationists, we like to keep, you know, church out of the state's business and the state certainly out of the church's business, we say that there are no shekels without shackles. That's my predecessor, Dr. Nathaniel Higgs. Y'all know Nate? So that's Nate's little cat catchphrase, and, and he kind of got me saying it, and so now I just continue to perpetuate the uh, saying. Religion holding its hand out to the government cannot fulfill its prophetic purpose. And when we talk about stewardship, even though we're talking about religious liberty today, when we talk about stewardship, it's not just about returning a tithe. It's not just about returning offering. Stewardship involves everything we do. The way we manage time, the way we manage our money, the way we manage our educational system, the way we manage putting our children in our educational system. All of this is incorporated into the idea of stewardship. And I think that when we as Adventists are looking for the government to help fund even something as important as our church schools. We have lost our focus because if church school isn't important to us, why should it be important to the government? The whole purpose behind church school brothers and sisters is evangelism. It is the largest evangelistic thing that your church does on nine months out of the year. You may be at work, but there are kids in an evangelistic program in school. So it's important. My father, a lot of you know, my father is a Muslim. There are five children in my, in my family. My father put every last one of us in the Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Seventh-day Adventist Church School because he knew that that church school was worth every penny that, that he had to do. A Muslim supporting Adventist education. Benjamin Franklin said this, when a religion is good, I conceive it will support itself. And when it does not support itself, and God does not take care to support it, so that its professors are obliged to call for the help of the civil power, tis a sign I apprehend of its being a bad one. <laughs> so, yeah. 
you probably have a bad religion if your members won't support you. A little bit more serious note, we have a new attorney general who does not believe in the separation of church and state. This is very serious. I think that most Adventist church members have overlooked it. He doesn't believe in it. His recommendation to replace him was Judge Roy Moore. Now, Judge Roy Moore did not get the did not get the tap on the shoulder from the governor of Alabama. Um, someone else did. Who? Strange? What's his name? Rindy? Luther Strange. Luther Strange. What do they call it? Big Luther? Is yeah. that his nickname? He's tall. He's super tall. Yeah. So they call him Big Luther. Um, he got it instead. But even, even who Jeff Sessions encouraged to uh, uh, go into that spot, Judge Roy more, he also does not believe that the Constitution says that church and state should be separate. Now, the legal scholars in the room will tell you, yes, it is correct. If you look in our Constitution, you cannot find the words wall of separation of church and state. But it is an idea that we have incorporated into our founding fathers' philosophy of how the church and the state will be separate. That idea was taken by Thomas Jefferson from another gentleman by the name of Roger Williams. So for you old timers, and I mean old timers, I'm not talking about the piano player. Do you know Roger Williams, the piano player? Yeah. <laughs> so, not that guy. I'm talking about the first governor to Rhode Island, Roger Williams, who is actually one of our, he's kind of one of our um, Protestant heroes, because he was persecuted by the Church of, yes, Baptists, he was persecuted by the Church of England, fled England, lived among the Native Americans for a long time, and came up with this idea of soul liberty, especially in regards to us forcing religion upon Native Americans. He said, everyone has soul liberty, and you shouldn't force religion upon people who don't want to accept it. Roger Williams came up with the idea that Thomas Jefferson kind of stole and is credited for many times. And he said that there's a wall that separates the beauty of the garden that is the church. There's a wall that separates the wilderness and the thorns and the thistles of the state. Because you don't want the thorns and the thistles to encroach upon the beauty of your garden. And you need a wall to keep those two separate. And that's where we come up with the idea that there's a wall of separation of church and state. So technically, Jeff Sessions is correct. You cannot look in the, in the um, Constitution and find those words. But our founding fathers have shown uh, time after time that they intended for these two entities to be divided and separate. And one of the biggest problems that they were concerned with about was that when they saw what was happening in Europe, where there was no separation of church and state, they saw that this, the church tried to control the state. And the state tried to control, or the church tried to control other people's religious beliefs. And that was unsettling to them. And they wanted to create a new Republic that had a different kind of experiment in democracy. And, and this, is, this is how we ended up with our Bill of Rights. It's interesting when you listen to evangelical Christians today, there's, for some reason, brothers and sisters who believe in prophecy, for some reason they're trying to get people to believe that there shouldn't be separation of church and state. Which recalls to mind something that Ellen White wrote in The Great Controversy. She said, only in flagrant violation of these safeguards to the nation's liberty. And she's talking about the Constitution. The Constitution is our safeguard to liberty. Only in flagrant violation of these safeguards to the nation's liberty can any religious observance be enforced by civil authority. 
but the inconsistency of such action is no greater than is presented in the symbol. It is the beast with lamb-like horns in profession, pure, gentle, harmless, that speaks like a dragon. Mm -hmm. So why would evangelical Christians today want to tell you that there shouldn't be separation of church and state to enforce their own ideology. We have had quite an interesting year. We started off in January, 10 days, I think, after the inauguration with an executive order that's now, at this point, been deemed unconstitutional by two courts. <laughs> and so let me start out by saying that when we talk about immigration today, I am going to ignore one key component to this executive committee, um, executive order. You can tell I'm a church employee, right? Executive committee. <laughs> the, um, the thing that we're going to ignore today is the issue of security, okay? And the reason that I'm ignoring it is because I'm not here to talk to you about security. I'm here to talk to you about religious liberty and the concerns that we have when you start separating out different populations and different religious populations. So the temporary order was to stop immigration in seven countries. Those are the seven countries. Now, for those of you who know me, you know that my daddy is from this country right here. So I'm going to admit that maybe I have a little bit of a bias because certainly my dad's not a, a uh, terrorist. I had a church member by the, in Gulf States who told me that I just my dad was a terrorist. I just didn't know he was a terrorist. So, <laughs> I was like, well, thank you very much. I'll be sure to mention to him that I know that about him now. <laughs> um, uh, not everyone that comes from these nations are terrorists. Not all Seventh-day Adventists are vegan, right? <laughs> so when we lump people into big, big sections, we're doing a disservice. Uh, there was a 121-day suspension on refugee programs. Now, one of the reasons that the um, those particular countries were named other than countries, you know, I, I protested that because 11 of the 19 hijackers from 9-11 were from a country that's not on that list. <laughs> there were no hijackers from, from Iraq on that list. <laughs> so I kind of thought, well, that's uh, leaving, leaving out some, some uh, key states where you have uh, lots of terrorist groups rising up. One of the things that the, the actual executive order was doing was putting a temporary suspension for that 120 days on uh, processing refugee claims. But it had an exemption in the executive order. If you came from a religion that was a minority religion in the country and you could show that you were being persecuted, then they would allow you in. So what would be the exception? If you were a Christian coming from a majority Muslim state or country, then you would be exempted out. I think overall we need to be concerned with this type of, uh, you know, sectioning out of society. In America, we've always said that we were one from many. E pluribus unum. It is our motto on our on our state seal, and we can get along with, with other religions, and we shouldn't start limiting who comes in based on their religious belief. The New Colossus, that's the name of the poem that people quote, you, you probably didn't know it was called the New Colossus, it says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, unless they're Muslim. Does it say that? So... Definitely, we don't want to do that. And then in March, after the president redid his executive order, 
This gentleman, who is Derek Watson, he's a U.S. District Judge in Honolulu, Hawaii, issued another, another decision from the bench, and he said that even the redone executive order was unconstitutional. Now, here is what his basis was. And he, he's, he's a super smart guy, graduated from Harvard Law School. He is projecting what objections to his decision will be. And he's kind of building this wall so that he can explain his reasoning. And he says that he, one of the things you can't do, apparently, if you're a judge, is you can't kind of decide that you're going to psychoanalyze the mind of the individual to see why they did that. You can't just psychoanalyze it and say, well, I think that this is why they did that. And so he's, he's using this and he's saying, let me show you what he says. He says, the government appropriately cautions that in determining purposes, courts should not look into veiled psyche and secret motives of government decision makers and may not undertake a judicial psychoanalysis of a drafter's heart of hearts. The government need not fear. The, resp the remarkable facts at issue here require no such impermissible inquiry. What he's saying is that nothing was veiled in the reasoning behind the president's issuance of the order. He says, for instance, there's nothing veiled about this press release. And he's quoting a press release from the election. Donald Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. <laughs> so he's saying that there is a historical record over the president's uh, campaign trail that this is, uh, th this is a specific aimed at Muslims, even though Donald Trump says, no, this is aimed at the countries that don't have good screening programs for their, their immigrants. And he says, no, this is, this is the start to um, defining who gets in based on religious tests. So should there be a religious test for entry into the United States? Ellen White says the United States was pivotal in its religious freedom in forming that this, this particular church came about in this country because of our religious freedom. So defining a refugee's admission into the U.S. based on religion is maybe a blight on our national commitment to religious liberty for all. There are other ways that we can screen dangerous individuals from entering the U.S. And if you take a look, almost all of the latest terrorist attacks that were imported terrorism, because we've had some terrorist attacks from homegrown terrorism, almost all of those imported attacks, even the attacks that have happened in Europe, the government has come back and said, yeah, we had that, we were watching that guy. We were watching, I mean, is the government watching everybody? Some people say yes, but clearly there were signs that, that some people are more dangerous than others. So what happens when you begin to sort people based on their religious beliefs? Do we know what happens when you start to sort people on their religious beliefs? What happens if you sort people on where they come from? We've done that too, haven't we, in the United States? 130,000 Japanese Americans were interned during World War II. Only 3,000 of those citizens voluntarily went to the internment camps. Out of 130,000, only 3,000 voluntarily went. So last night I told you we were going to talk about this. Lester, remember last year I was at Mountainside and Gary comes running down the hall. He goes, stop the seminar. Anybody here from, from Mountainside? Stop the seminar. I'm like, what's up, Gary? He goes, Scalia is dead. I'm like, you're watching the news during my seminar, Gary? <laughs> right? What an insult. That guy. So there we go. Did y'all see that? Do I need to go back? Go back, watch. Like magic. There's the new justice. 
boy, he's got a big head. <laughs> hey, look at Clarence over there. Clarence is like, get this photo over with. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm not smiling now. <laughs> One thing that's happening with Gorsuch is that, as you see, this is, this is last year's Supreme Court. This is the Supreme Court from last week. <laughs> what happens is Gorsuch in, um, is inserted into Scalia's place is that we actually have added another Protestant, a the single Protestant, onto the court. However, let's look at this Protestant. He's the judge that did the Hobby Lobby case. If you don't know that now, you're probably living in a cave. <laughs> he's 49. This makes him the youngest justice on the court. It means it's very easily he's going to be the justice for the next 40 years on that court. He's got 40 years to go. Here's the interesting thing. He grew up Catholic, but converted to Episcopalianism. Is, is that Episcopalianism? So, are y'all like me? This is, yeah, are you recording this? Oh, no. So, are y'all like me? Did y'all read that? You go, yeah, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. Is that what y'all were thinking? Right? <laughs> she's going she's to give me a, a fist bump when I get over there. <laughs> so we'll have to see what uh, this particular justice is going to do. He's an originist. That means that he's going to, I think, be a lot like Scalia was. He believes in the original interpretation of the Constitution and that it hasn't changed and it's not as flexible as some people um, try to make it. So we'll just see if this is going to be good for religious liberty or bad for religious liberty. I actually am not that upset with the way he determined the Hobby Lobby case. Because in Hobby Lobby, he, he used the, it's my understanding that the way they, they interpreted the Hobby Lobby case was that, number one, they viewed that as being a company that was sole proprietorship it wasn't a big, it's a big, huge company, but it's very different than big, huge companies across America. We think of corporations like Federal Express and Walmart and Sands and all of these other big corporations, these huge conglomerations that are just kind of eating, eating everything. But Hobby Lobby, while it is big and huge, it's still only owned by one family. The Greens own that. Nobody else owns that. The Greens own that. So it is, it is a closely held corporation. And, and part of that influenced their decision to say because it was a closely held corporation, that the corporation itself could be reflective of the religion of the owners. Okay? So traditionally there's been a debate that a corporation can't hold religious beliefs. But the, the key here was, can a closely held corporation hold a religious belief? So we'll see what will happen there. How much Chick-fil-A also closely held uh, corporation. They close on Sundays. You can't, you can't get your, your biscuits and your superfood salad. I don't like that superfood salad, y'all. I like the coleslaw better. Anybody else? I'm a coleslaw girl. I don't care. Kale. Do y'all remember what we used to use kale for? It was the decoration on the buffet at Pizza Hut. It was that stuff stuck in the in the uh, in the ice. That's a, yeah. Every now and then, my mom tries to sneak kale into my smoothie. Does it kale in this thing? Actually, I like kale in a smoothie. I shouldn't say bad things about it. So here is the next thing that we're going to see if you're keeping your eye on the Supreme Court. We've got, the this is a playground case. It's Trinity Lutheran Church who applied for money for a, a grant from the state of Missouri to add improvements to their church playground. And the state constitution prohibits churches from receiving money and so they were rejected the grant because the state's constitution has a Blaine Amendment in it. Remember we mentioned Blaine Amendments earlier. 
No money shall ever be taken from the public treasury, directly or indirectly, in aid of any church, sect, or denomination of religion. And so because that is in the state constitution, the state denied the grant. And the Trinity Lutheran Church took them to court. So now the Supreme Court has the case. I am not normally a betting per person, but if I were to bet with this Supreme Court, I will say that the church is about to get the money. That's just what I'm predicting. But I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't say for sure. Interesting thing happened this week. If you want the latest religious liberty news, a House Bill 1523 in Mississippi has gone to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. They're going to look to see whether or not this, is, this particular act is uh, constitutional. Now, if y'all don't know what a FATA is, a FATA is the First Amendment Defense Act. And in Mississippi, this particular bill that got passed was very controversial because opponents to the bill says it would allow for widespread pre-civil right error style uh, discrimination. And that you could say, you know, that you don't agree with Jewish people, so you're not going to allow Jewish people to stay in your hotel. Uh, or you don't agree with a homosexual, so you're not going to serve a homosexual couple on their anniversary when they come to your, your restaurant with their child. Uh, you know, so this is what has made this bill controversial. The proponents of the bill, the people who like the bill, say no, it's not controversial. It's simply protecting the freedoms that you have for your religious liberty beliefs, your individual religious liberty beliefs that you're given in the First Amendment. So we're going to see what's going to happen. My guess is that the Fifth Circuit is going to pronounce that FATA bill unconstitutional. That's just my guess. So as we go along, and we're getting closer and closer to end time, I always kind of like to take a look and see how times they are at changing, right? In 1919, the country was pretty anti-Catholic still. And as a result, in the state of Nebraska, the Ku Klux Klan got this bill passed that no religious garb would be worn in public schools when teachers were teaching. Now, it's an obscure bill now. It's, what, 90 years old, 89 years old, something like that? And awareness came about over the last two years because there was a nun who was prohibited from wearing her habit when she was substitute teaching. Do nuns need another job? <laughs> was she moonlighting? <laughs> so, so uh, I think this was two weeks ago. Um, Nebraska, uh, Nebraska ended that particular um, issue. And the Nebraska legislature's reasoning was that teachers shouldn't have to abandon their religious headgear at the schoolhouse door in order to keep church and state separate. That just because you walk through a door as a state employee doesn't mean that any religiousness that you bring through that state door is going to do away with that wall of separation. It says you can still keep the two separate and allow people of faith to follow their religious dress standards. Now, I like the determination that was given here because it goes to something that we've seen over the last four years very heavily over the last four years. And, and it's kind of been a knee-jerk reaction to anything religious in the public square. You know, you can have your religion at home, you can have your religion um, at church, but Leave it in your car when you get to work. Don't take it to, you know, the marathon race when you go there. Don't take it 
to, to Taco Bell because you're not going to get a haystack at Taco Bell. You're only going to get a taco salad at Taco Bell. You know, that kind of thing. So I, I like the, 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 the way that Nebraska was going with this. But let's, let's look at this cartoon, and I'm sorry for the people sitting in the back. You're not going to be able to see this very well. Here's a cartoon from Ellen White's time. Can you guys see this? It's called The American River King, uh, Gangs. I thought it was gangs, so <laughs> what it's gangs. Um, this is from 1875. And if you take a look very closely, do you see the crocodiles on the riverbank? Mm -hmm. But do you see what the crocodiles are? Mm -hmm. oh. What are they? Oh. Can you see the crocodile better there? Do you see that that is a Catholic? He kind of looks like the Pope. There's his little shoes, his little red slippers. There's his pontifical hat. There's his nose. There's his mouth. I, I couldn't get it to fit in if I went back. Now people are seeing it. So look at the difference in a little over a hundred years. This is from Harper's Weekly. And the whole idea that's going on here, this is in regards to legislative uh, agendas concerning schools and you can see right here it says schools the school is being attacked it's see it looks like part of the I don't know ramparts or whatever have been kind of knocked down anybody in this cartoon wearing a tall hat should be associated with other people wearing tall hats okay are you seeing that so here's the public school teacher the Protestant public school teacher defending the poor uh, school public school children from the crocodiles on the banks coming up to get them. And you see these tall hats here? What are they doing? They're dropping the kids out of the church school onto the riverbank for the crocodiles to get. And any and any church and any school teacher, public school teacher that they can get, they're taking him over here to be hanged. Okay? Now you would never, ever see this cartoon on the cover of a magazine today. Because the mortal wound of that beast in Revelation has been healed. But in 1875, the wound was still bleeding quite heavily. This was a legislative agenda item where um, they were trying to keep Catholics out of public schools and not, uh, there were a lot of things going on. This is, by the way, Ellen White's time and A.T. Jones's time that our forefathers are dealing with. And we'll talk a little bit about that in my last seminar today. Um, so let's go to this as we see how times are changing. So we have this very worrisome issue uh, that's being proposed. And it was, it was part of the campaign promise during the election year last year. And in February, the Free Speech Fairness Act was introduced um, into both houses. And it's a bill that would essentially do away with the Johnson Amendment, which is the IRS's prohibition on 501c3 entities engaging in politics. Okay, let me advance to this slide. Uh, right now, the exemption or the, the limit is that you, if you're a 501c3, you may not attempt to influence, le influence legislation as a substantial part of your activity, and you may not participate in any campaign activity for or against political candidates. Now, one of the things I have on the table up here, and I'll hand it out in just a minute, is I have the church's just released a statement on this particular bill and this particular attempt to do away with the prohibitions on campaigning by churches. And the church has taken a very solid stand to say that we are not in favor of this bill being passed. Let's look at Ellen White and what she says in The Great Controversy. Whenever the church has obtained secular power, she's employed it as to, to punish dissent from her doctrines. Protestant churches that have followed in the steps of Rome 
by forming alliance with worldly powers, have manifested a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. So what would you do if you're a church that is no longer restricted in giving campaign contributions to a candidate, or engaging solely for the purpose of, of, of impressing upon legislatures certain bills and passages of laws. What danger is there in churches becoming that powerful to be able to control what happens in the legislature? I pulled this one really quickly. I was sitting sitting up here right before Clarence and Kimberly got up. I, I was reminded of this. This is from uh, Prophets and Kings. It says, Not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. Look at this. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. Brothers and sisters, if you're a church that gave money to an elected official and you say, we think that a Sunday law would be a great idea. Do I have to continue in this line of thinking? This is very worrisome. And if you're not worried, then you're living in a cave. You're living in a cave. I brought with me, and it's a handout, we'll get to you in, in a little bit. I brought with me the church's statement, the review, online review, published the statement, I think a week and a half ago. And I wanted y'all to read it to see what your church is doing. In strong opposition of this law, to change the law, this is from Amanda Tyler, she's the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. She said, to change the law would hinder the church's prophetic witness threatening to turn pulpit prophets into political puppets. Oh, I love the alliteration. Pulpit prophets into political puppets. So uh, this is the 500th year anniversary to the Protestant Reformation. You cannot forget that. You cannot forget that. It's important. Uh, homework, go home. Just read the last 10 chapters. You'll be so involved, by the time you get to the end of the book, you'll say, oh, let me go back and read it from the beginning. <laughs> the beginning's full of a lot of history. It's, it's full of the Protestant Reformation and the horrible things that happened in, uh, in Europe during, during the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that this simple act, posting this list of grievances that he had with the Catholic Church, changed everything. It ended up changing not just religion. It changed politics, the way politics were done. It changed the social structure of Europe. It changed the economic uh, structure of the world just by having this dissent against the Catholic Church. And, and Martin Luther never meant to, to, he just had a grievance he wanted to address. He, he never meant to do what he did. <laughs> and more. <laughs> Some of our, our more famous Protestant reformers that we remember, John Calvin, uh, the uh, father of Calvinism, John Knox, William of Orange. Anybody know William of Orange's nickname? It's something that nobody will ever call me. William the Silent. <laughs> Roger Williams, we talked about Roger Williams, the great Anabaptist earlier. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, Oliver Crom Cromwell kind of died in disgrace <clears throat> in uh, Great Britain, but uh, I think it was just recently he, uh, when Great Britain were polled, he made it onto like the top ten best, uh, best British person ever list. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of redeemed himself in the in, in death. <laughs> Here's something now. I don't want to tell on anybody's daughter here, but I'm about to tell on your daughter. So I'm sitting in church. I want to know what religious liberty people do in church. We text each other horrible Protestant things that we see and, and can't keep it to ourselves. So I'm sitting in church. It's two years ago, and I get this text message from Melissa. 
Elder Reed's daughter, texts me while I'm in church. And she's given me the link to this thing. And she says in her text message, stop whatever you're doing and read this right now. You're going to be amazed. And sure enough, I was... So now we've got this thread. It's me and Todd and Dwayne, and we're all, it's the middle of church and we're texting. <laughs> but we're being good Protestants because we're so upset. We can't keep it to ourselves. So here the Pope, the Pope is apologizing and trying to get forgiveness from the Waldensians in Torre Colegi. A year before this, this visit, I sat in that place. I sat right, these, these pews right here go this way, I sat right back there, in that pew. And here's the Pope apologizing for all the horrific things, all the Waldensians that the Catholic Church killed. In one Sunday alone, they massacred children, babies, mm -hmm. women, old people, 1,300. The priest rolled into Torre Polici, took a look at the massacre, and their response was, well, this is a good start. Whoa. We forget what Protestantism is about. Yeah. My yeah. uncle, a dear, dear man, he's Cumberland Presbyterian. He doesn't know what the Protestant Reformation is about. Mm -hmm. Why? When I talked to him about it, after I got back from my great controversy tour, he said, why don't I know this? And I said, because people don't talk about it. But this is key. This is history. I said, it's why you're a Protestant and not a Catholic. He said, but I've never heard of this before. So you want to know how many people don't believe in Sabbath? The same number of people don't know what happened during the Protestant Reformation. And this Catholic Church is just a great thing. Let's all just, you know, be one big happy family. So I'm at the end here. Six minutes for, wait, what's my end time? 12, oh, 20 minutes for Q&A. Did, did you write down any questions? Are y'all seeing how things are coming together? You see how Jesus is coming soon. He is coming soon and we can't ignore it. Any questions or do we just ask me? Okay. Hey, Gloria. Are you talking about in Georgia or yeah? So in Georgia, it didn't. I didn't see that it passed. Um, so it's still a conjecture. But I, we're going to face it until it passes. I think. And the further along we get, I, I think vouchers are are going to happen no matter what. Um, I'll be honest with you and tell you that both conferences, I shouldn't say this probably, both conferences accept the North Carolina Opportunity Scholarships at church schools. So one, one conference, and I won't say which one, has 55 students in one school on that scholarship program. It's North Carolina. Okay. And the church school principal for that one, he always wants to come and argue with me and say, no, 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 we need to throw all these kids in, take as much money as we can, and, and let the consequences work themselves out. And I said, no, no, no. When something is free, it has no value. I said, when something is free, it has no value. The only exception to that is salvation. The only exception is salvation. So there is no such thing as free lunch. Even under the Opportunity Scholarship programs, you have to meet certain requirements to get the money. Now the reason they're taking the money is they say, well, we don't have to do anything. We already meet those requirements. Well, that's fine now. That's how they get you addicted to something. Your first piece of crack cocaine may be free. No, oh, it's free. That's all you need. One free try. So, good question, Gloria. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question for the last night's session? Oh, is it a question or a comment? A question. 
Okay, question. Information really. Okay. Okay. Um, if your if your uh, your grandchild if a child has two parents of the same sex, how do you uh, approach telling that child the truth without offending? You know, without stepping on. Now you're asking for the wisdom of Solomon. My name is Amira, not Solomon. <laughs> you're specifically talking about maybe a grandchild. I heard you say right. grandchild. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I think that what you do is rather than point out the error, you point out the way God's plan is. So I don't walk around and tell people homosexuality is bad. It's a sin. You're a sinner. No, not you know, I, I say God's plan was that man and woman be married. A lifetime commitment of love and companionship. And I said, we're so far from sin that anything goes. And just because it's the norm in your life doesn't mean it's what God wants in your life. You know. So I don't know if that helps, but that's probably how I would do it. I don't know. Right, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to a certain extent, when children are little, uh, you need to be careful with small children. They're, they're cognitive skills. You know, you don't want them thinking, well, Grandma hates both my mommy, or, you know, both my daddy, or whatever it's going to be. You know, it's, no, Grandma wants the best. Grandma wants to see you in heaven. <laughs> you know, so it's it's out of love. So. Now, no more questions from last night, because I answered last night's question and three people raised their hand. I, I see this, this lady. It's not a question, but when someone asks the question, can you repeat it? So oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. That was what you were going to say, Pastor yeah. Florence? Okay. Right. All right. So what was her question? Well, her question was, how do you, I don't, want to, I don't want to misquote you, how do you approach a child who is in a family where there, there are two mommies or two daddies or, or that? How do, you, how do you witness to that child um, without turning against the parents or uh, that? Yes. I've had, I, I do, I, I have at least two children in my room that... They have two mommies. Yeah. You're a public and, uh, school teacher? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And uh, uh, prayerfully, I approach them. Because, like you said, you don't want the child to feel inferior or, or get a complex because they already got to deal with that. So you don't need to add to what they're already dealing with. I have one where the little girl, I mean, I get along with her fine. I love her. And she talks to me. But the one that's playing the role of the father, mm -hmm. he says, well, she says, uh, she won't hardly talk to me or anything. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the child dislikes the person. It's probably the child can't understand the situation. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They're confused. Yeah. It's, it's a confusing situation that wants to be treated like the norm, yeah. and it's not. And it's, it's hard. It's very hard. And now I will say that we had two different scenarios in the questions that just got um, passed through. We had the scenario that I was taking from a family member who was trying to deal with this. And then we have a totally different scenario from a church, a, a, a school teacher, not a church school teacher, a school teacher who is really going to tread on thin ice if she starts to promote her religious beliefs in the classroom regarding family lifestyles. So keep in mind, these are two very different situations that, that probably will be handled a little bit differently uh, than what it's what Pastor Barber. I, I, you know, I think what's going to come down the pike, too, because we have... We have a lot of people who are... Uh oh he stood up. <laughs> <laughs> but, looking, but looking at all of that's going on, we've got people in the medical profession who does work on Sabbath, hospitals or whatever. When is it that that is not going to be permissible because of the great controversy? Mm -hmm. Even though they do that, and they're saying they're doing it because... 
under the guard of service of people, and they're getting paid. But when does it come to the point when your working on Sunday is no longer, no longer paid, it becomes a great controversy in that it's legislated that you've got to do this or else. I haven't necessarily taken it that far, but I, th I think because we, um, and, I, and I will say that I, when it comes to prophecy, I always double check with, with Pastor Reed here, Elder Reed, and I was like, do I have this right? <laughs> um, what, I, what I would say is that we serve a God who is kind and loving and good to us, and that the last days are going to be terrible, and the last days are going to be quick. And I think that one of the last things that's going to happen will be the Sunday law, not necessarily the first thing that will happen. And, and so for that, I've never taken that particular scenario that far into the situation. I think that it's not going to be an issue of whether you get paid to work or not. I think it's going to be an issue of liberty of conscience altogether. Yes. So, yes, sir. Have you heard what they're trying to ban homeschooling? Well, um, there's, there, you know, the homeschool lobby lobby groups are very um, strong and they have gotten stronger over time because actually the homeschool the strong homeschool lobbies are the Christian groups and if if we're correct in assuming that it will be people of faith you know imposing liberty of conscience issues upon us um, you know I, I think that they're going to stay strong for, for, for a long while. We're, we're lucky that we are not Canada or Europe. I just thought, did y'all see the news this week about the, the father who took his child out of British public school for a seven day trip to Disney World and was fined and he lost. He said she had a 90% attendance rate, which is considered good. And the court said, no, you've inconvenienced the teachers and you've inconvenienced the other children by taking your daughter out of school. And the only reason you took her out of school was because it was your convenience that you wanted to go to Disney World when price fares were cheap. Well, guess what? I like to go to the beach when nobody's there. <laughs> yes, it's my convenience. And yes, I talked my brother and sister-in-law into going to the beach in October. <laughs> Australia, they were trying to say there was kind of abuse. Right. Abuse. Australia's, the, Austra anybody here from Australia? Don't get that video out to Australians. Australians <laughs> live on their head, mm -hmm. so this affects the blood flow. <laughs> I love Australians. Lincoln State is Australian. I shouldn't say anything too bad about you. Uh, Gloria, and then did I have another hand? Yeah. since you're considering everyone else's church commitments, you need to understand that I can't do it on Saturdays because Saturday is my, my commitment. <laughs> but did they give you... It's in limbo, so I want to know, should I just go ahead and start writing? When does the clinic start? When does the clinic start? It's going on already. Oh, it is. But the chairman has said, you want full participation from the yeah. Um, I think he's just saying he wants everybody on board. I don't think he's really going to give you a problem. But if you do encounter the problem, 
Well, you're already you're already looked at as the nonconformist. I mean, come on. So uh, you just call me and let me know as soon as you it, it, as soon as it appears that you're actually going to get on a schedule or he's not going to abide by your your request. Yeah. So the sooner someone has a Sabbath problem and they know they have a Sabbath problem, boom, call. Oh, yes. Okay. Not made up problems, but real problems. Call immediately. And this is the number that you call, and you'll ask for my associate director, Pastor Kevin James. Sometimes he's the king of queens. That's a joke. Okay, y'all don't watch TV. All right. So, uh, let's see, do we have more time still? Another question? Do I have a question over here? Okay, great. So we're going to switch out computers, and uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you.